Hello, everyone. You are watching the Asian American Herald, a new media network. This show is being aired via live stream on Facebook, and a recording will be available afterwards at our Facebook page, Asian American Herald. My name is Himani Gupta Carlson, and I'm a professor at Empire State College in Saratoga Springs, New York, as well as a community-based farmer and writer. So I want to open our show tonight first by offering respect to the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. The Haudenosaunee is a confederacy of six nations, including the Mohawk, who are the original caretakers of the lands where I reside. I thank them for offering me shelter in their territories for the past decade, and I acknowledge my status here as a settler. So our guest tonight is Sujata Gibson. She is a civil rights attorney in Ithaca, New York, and for the past several years has served as the defense attorney for the We Are Seneca Lake movement in the Finger Lakes region. She also made a vigorous grassroots bid early this year to be the Democratic Party nominee for the 125th District of the New York State Assembly. So Sujata, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. It's pleasure. wonderful to be here. Yeah, it's our pleasure to have you. So I'd like to actually start just by asking you to tell us more about your background. Where were you born and where did you grow up? And how did you come to do the kind of work that you do today? Well, I was born in uh, Ithaca, New York, where I live now. And uh, my father's from India and my mother's from Indiana. Um, and they met here at Cornell. Um, and I grew up in a, a little bit of an unusual household. Uh, my father was sort of a reluctant uh, spiritual guru to many in the community. I don't, he didn't really want to be, but people would kind of see him that way. But we had you know, people of religious faiths uh, from all different faiths at our house, and we were very political, politically active with Kuslar and other groups. Um, and so I just sort of grew up around activism and religious tolerance and kind of civil rights and trying to make sure that, uh, you know, grew up with the principles that we need to make sure that everybody is respected um, and and not privileged, um, you know, and looking out for those who are being uh, disrespected and treated badly. So that's how I ended up uh, getting into the uh, the field of activism, but I, I started off after college as a union organizer, um, spent many years organizing unions across this state, um, and then eventually decided to go to law school because it seemed like I might be able to have a more reasonable schedule as a lawyer than an organizer and kind of do some of the, the impactful litigation that I, I feel is so important. Okay, great. So um, tell us a bit about the We Are Seneca Lake movement. Um, I know it's kind of um, very well known down in the Ithaca area where you are. It's, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit less well known up here. So I wonder if you could just give us a little background on the movement and then how did you come to get involved with it and become its legal representative? Well, uh, the We Are Seneca Lake movement started because um, some of the gas companies decided that they wanted to make the Finger Lakes the fracked gas hub of the Northeast. Um, so they wanted to store all of the, or you know, substantial amount of the fracked gas um, from the region here in these crumbling salt mines on the banks of Seneca Lake, which is the drinking water source for 100,000 people. It's really the heart of our agritourism um, economy and, and really the heart of our of our community. These Finger Lakes are sacred to all of us who live here in many different ways and also necessary for our survival. So, um, you know, initially there were all kinds of political uh, actions to try to get the political decisions reversed. Um, uh, half of the, you know, parts of the kinds of oil that were being stored or the compressed gas um, were regulated by a federal agency and, and some by a state agency. And the federal agency, FERC, um, is notorious for really being kind of immovable from any political process. You know, they're funded by the, the, the pipeline projects that they approve and they aren't really accountable politically to anyone they're appointed. Um, so 
they rarely, uh, almost never deny a, a project, no matter how dangerous. And they they agreed uh, that Crestwood Midstream, the Texas oil company, could go forward with the plan, even though there was a 40% chance of catastrophic, irreversible destruction of our entire lake and, and ecosystem. Um, so anyway, so people started, they had no more kind of uh, regular political avenues to pursue. Um, and so people started doing the next logical thing, which is just putting their bodies in front of the gate and saying, the trucks can't come in. Um, and it was somewhat symbolic, I mean, because people weren't there all the time, but I got involved early on, I think the second group of people to get arrested doing this um, back in 2014. And I just, I really actually hadn't planned on taking on this whole project. I just went because I thought, well, what I can do if people are out there getting arrested, spending two weeks in jail, um, you know, just for this nonviolent protest, the least that I can do is I can go and support them at one arraignment. I'm very busy. I have a little kid, you know, everything, but I'm going to go to one arraignment. And so I went there. An arraignment is like a, a criminal process proceeding, the, the first appearance in court. And I was shocked what I saw at this arraignment in this little court. And, um, you know, all these these act nonviolent, peaceful protesters who had really not done much, if anything, and I didn't think were actually guilty were being sent to jail for two weeks, which is on a, the equivalent of a traffic ticket. It was a violation level charge, which you never see people going to jail for unless it's like a plea deal where they've done something much worse and they pleaded the violation. There's this technical ability to send them to jail, but it, it's rarely done. So um, I was infuriated and shocked and uh, decided I, I had to uh, be all in. So. Pretty quickly, I, I um, you know, offered pro bono legal services and worked with the organizers to set up an entire legal defense center and, and pretty much dedicated the next three years of my life, waking and whatever sleep I could get, to, uh, to representing these protesters. Um, in the course of the three years of active actions, 657 uh, arrests and prosecutions were made. And... Uh, we got dismissals or, you know, one through trial, most of them. And then I started a clinic at Cornell and we, and we appealed the rest and succeeded. So ultimately, though, the movement succeeded, <laughs> which is more important than the legal charges. Um, and uh, Crestwood Midstream ended up uh, canceling the project. So it was a great success story in our region. Wow. Well, congratulations. That is awesome. You know, listening to it, especially um, the idea of fracked gas being stored kind of in this um, very, very environmentally sensitive area um, was really reminding me of other movements associated with water and other vital natural resources. And I couldn't help but keep thinking about the Dakota Pipeline Project. And so, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, you reference tourism and drinking water, but oftentimes there's more. There's spiritual and cultural elements and there's histories of settler colonialism. And I was wondering, you know, to what extent are those elements present or were present in the movement? And how did you um, work to build bridges across um, those kinds of diverse interests? I think those those that is a vital question <laughs> and it's, um, a little outside of the scope, you know, as the lawyer for the movement, my job had to be sort of focused and reined in. And it's actually an interesting experience being a former political, you know, union organizer and political activist, uh, now being a lawyer, um, it's a very different role. So my job is really not to dictate how the movement kind of organizes itself or even messages itself to some extent I do and the court proceedings definitely play a part in any civil disobedience movement um, but so I didn't have direct control over a lot of that but I I would say that um, there was quite a, a large spiritual element and a growing understanding that um, you, you know and a, a recognition of what environment the environmental fight has to do with indigenous sovereignty rights and um race racial justice you know there's a huge connection that i think has been 
not as you know not made as fast as I'd like to see it made in a, a lot of the environmental movement, but I think is certainly growing in the water protection movement. And Standing Rock played a huge role in really bringing that to the forefront of many people's consciousness and understanding this isn't in isolation. You know, we can't just be environmental activists and leave racial justice to other people or indigenous rights to other people. It's very much connected. And in terms of the spiritual aspect, I mean, that's what brought me to this in the first place. It, when I said that we have this spiritual connection to the water, everyone around here, it's it's really palpable. I mean, I, when I first saw the sign that they were going to store gas, I just blurted out, you know, over my dead body. And so it wasn't surprising to me that people just literally put their bodies in front of the gates because this water is so central to who we are. And even the name of the movement, you know, we're saying we are Seneca Lake. This water is flowing through our blood and our soul. And you can't just do this to this lake without destroying us all. Well, that's really, that's, that's very insightful. And it's actually really beautifully put. It sounds like that the process of building the movement, and not from your not from your direct involvement, but from the uh, from the people who were organizing, that there was this kind of growing awareness over time that we are Seneca Lake meant something much more than um, this lake is not a place to store fracked gas. That there was something much deeper than that. Right. <laughs> not that that's not that that's not significant. So I want to turn to um, a different issue now. Um, you've been representing families with medically fragile children who are at risk of incurring illness through vaccines. And I saw um, this past summer um, that you incurred some opposition as a result. And so I was wondering if you could just tell us a little about these cases and how this opposition um, arose. Sure. Well, it's an incredibly sensitive topic with a lot of kind of heated opinions, but more importantly, quite a lot of uh, kind of media messaging uh, that takes away from the the, the, the actual question. So, um, what the the families that I represent, I'm I'm doing a class action lawsuit in federal court right now for families of medically fragile children whose uh, licensed physicians have certified that they're at risk of harm from one of or more of the vaccines. Um, so it's not like for everyone, it's not every vaccine. Sometimes it's one vaccine, sometimes it's all of them, depending on their physical condition and the reasons for the exemption. Um, but all of them have in common that they uh, have one or more licensed physicians certifying that they're at risk of harm. Um, some of these families have lost siblings to uh, vaccine deaths that have been proven in vaccine court. Um, you know, they they all have good reasons. <laughs> so, um, and, and that's not surprising. I mean, it's not really talked about a whole lot, but we, it's widely acknowledged by anyone who knows about vaccines that there are some people who they're not safe for, at least, one, you know, one or more might not be safe for. And so, um, so last year, the, the law, uh, there were some changes in the law. The religious exemption to vaccines was removed. The medical exemption remained, but the Department of Health decided to uh, put in place all these regulations which regulate it to the extent that it's really eviscerated for most people who need it. Um, and so in the last year, hundreds of children have been kicked out of school, children who many of them have had medical exemptions for years. Um, many of them have three or more specialists saying this child is really in imminent danger of harm. And there, the way that the law is structured, school principals are given sole authority to overrule their treating physicians. So it's really um, a tragedy uh, that has been unfolding. Um, in fact, these children are not even allowed. There's kind of a misperception that they're not allowed in public school, but actually they're not allowed in any school, public or private. And they're also not even allowed to take online education or access entirely remote resources. Um, it's very punitive. Um, and, and it's been really uh, very painful and shocking uh, to see. I had no idea of the extent until I started working uh, more in depth on this case. 
So uh, that's the case. Um, we're in federal court right now, but there is um, there's sort of a knee jerk reaction and I can understand it's, it's a very difficult question to what extent, you know, our responsibility to keep one another safe interacts with our autonomy over our own bodies and our right to make medical decisions in, especially in connection with a physician. Um, and there's a lot of different valid perspectives on that, that I respect. So. Yeah. Um, boy, that almost reminds me of the many, many contours of the pro-choice stance. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it gets so polarized in media and in politics, but there's actually so many nuances. There really it. are. And there's this sort of, this, there's this sort of trend right now to just have this reflexive pro-vax or anti-vax stance. And I definitely caught a lot of, uh, that in the campaign. <laughs> you know, there's just sort of this reflexive yeah. idea that if you have any, uh, criticism or, or believe there's any need for reform in either vaccine policy or, um, you know, safety trials that you are somehow anti-vaccine. And, uh, you know, I think that there's a, a very different, I mean, first of all, I'm a human rights and civil rights attorney. So uh, my stance is always going to be that, that these rights are really sacred and need to be protected and that we need to work on, you know, the safety of the community through, uh, other means than violating fundamental human rights like informed consent. But, um, but you know, any kind of discussion of any reform uh, will often lead to just a, an accusation of being anti-vax. But I think over time people started to hear a little bit more of my message, um, which is that I'm not <laughs> anti-vaccine. I'm just pro-vaccine choice and pro-vaccine reform and accountability of pharmaceutical companies. So. Yeah, and vaccines, you know, obviously are on our minds quite a bit these days as COVID as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to rage. Um, and there's been so many different efforts to develop a vaccine for the virus so that we can, you know, stop um, kind of being isolated from each other and wearing masks in public and kind of try to return to those normal lives that we had um, back in January and February. Um, but at the same time, I mean, there are so many questions about the, state, the speed at which the vaccines are being developed and the safety of them. And there's a lot of concern that a vaccine won't work partly because people won't take it because they don't trust it. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, um, like what are the real questions should we, what, what are the real questions that we should be asking about a coronavirus vaccine? Um, well, I think the first thing to note about all of the coronavirus vaccines that are in production right now is that all of them fall into the category of vaccines that are not designed or capable of providing what's called sterilizing immunity. They can only provide personal protection. So it's actually not really discussed a lot. I mean, each vaccine really needs to be discussed individually, but um, there are some vaccines like the measles vaccine, which can stop you from having personal symptoms, but can also, um, you know, the design of it is to stop you from transmitting it to other people, replicating it and transmitting it to other people. But many of the vaccines on the mandatory schedule and all of the coronavirus vaccines in development at best can stop you from experiencing the full range of uh, symptoms from coronavirus, but you will still replicate it and asymptomatically transmit it. So I think I'm very alarmed at this uh, sort of sloppy discussion about this as a in the media and even by some public health officials who have acknowledged this in you know in writing that they know that these vaccines are not going to be able to stop asymptomatic transmission but they're kind of hyping it up with the same herd immunity idea as as measles which actually that vaccine can 
provide herd immunity. So I, but they're saying, you know, it'd be irresponsible if anyone opts out. What if people don't take it, then it won't work for everyone unless everyone takes it. Well, that's not how this one works. So I think we need to be very um, skeptical and very careful about uh, any push for a mandate on the grounds of herd immunity for this vaccine. But also uh, I'm extremely alarmed about the speed with which they're developing this. Um, vaccine regulations, you know, safety testing is already an area of great concern for me, which is why I say, you know, I care about vaccine reform, not, I'm not anti-vax, but um, they have very little checks and balances, the pharmaceutical industry as it is. This one is even getting to do less, but normally vaccines are the only pharmaceutical product, product that you don't have to do double blind placebo testing on them at all. And most of them have never been tested against a placebo, an inert placebo, or have had randomized testing. You don't have to follow up really in any capacity. You don't need to, um, I mean, there's just a variety of things that they're not required to do. So you can really speed them through very fast. They're not even subjected to, um, you know, some of the modern safety testing that we could be looking for, like animal viruses that hitch a ride, which often happens with vaccines um, and other kind of basic things that we could be doing to make them safer. Uh, they're not required to do that. And then on top of that, there's no kind of financial check and balance as there is in other contexts. So for most pharmaceutical products, the way that we find out that they're dangerous is that there's a lawsuit and the pharmaceutical industry gets sued and they have to give discovery. And that's where you find the things like Merck covering up Vioxx known dangers and you know knowing that it was killing people and saying nothing. Um, you, we did this through you know plaintiff's attorney's bars, but you can't sue pharmaceutical companies for vaccine injury. Um, Reagan made a law in 1986, well, he signed the law in 1986 that took all liability away from them. So now you can't even sue them at all. You have to go to a special vaccine court where you can't get any discovery. So all those memos we get in the Vioxx cases and the other cases that show that the pharmaceutical companies knew it was dangerous and didn't fix it, you can't get that in vaccine litigation. Um, you can't get any discovery. There's hearsay. And if you win, then the government pays the payout instead of the pharmaceutical company. So they have no financial stake in making vaccines safer. So I think that we really need to pay attention to those problems, um, as well as other problems like direct financial conflicts of interest with the regulatory agencies that are overseeing vaccines. They, the, the CDC actually owns patents and makes money off of the vaccines that it mandates. So, and Congress has many times investigated and found outrageous uh, personal conflicts of interest that are allowed to go on in that context as well. So I think, I think the public should demand, this is an opportunity with a spotlight on these vaccines. You know, this could maybe be very useful to have but I think we need to demand double blind placebo testing and we need to demand, you know, disclosure and, and probably financial liability too, because I think we're doing ourselves a grave disservice by taking that away, those checks and balances away. Pharmaceutical companies cannot be trusted and anyone who, who, who says otherwise has not looked into this situation. Yeah. Wow. That makes me makes me feel very nervous about any kind of vaccine or any kind of um, thing that I get. Um, is it possible to make this vaccine um, or a vaccine um, protect against asymptomatic spreading? Um, we've never made a coronavirus vaccine that can. A, a cold, so coronavirus is a, a kind of virus that's, I mean, you know, uh, related to the cold virus, we've never been able to make like a cold virus vaccine that can stop the spread. And wow. I don't know, they don't have any in production right now for the COVID vaccine that can stop asymptomatic transmission. Not to say they couldn't, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure there are very in, uh, brilliant minds working on this right now, but, but right now we don't have that. Wow. So we would be essentially taking a vaccine that would allow us to feel relatively well, even if we're 
carrying the virus, but in order to protect the greater good, we would still be wearing masks and practicing social distancing. Maybe, but maybe, um, maybe people wouldn't even bother with it then because they would think, because there's not a lot of public education about vaccines and that's sort of intentional on the part of uh, pharmaceutical companies and, and captured regulatory agencies dealing with public health. They don't really talk about the differences. I mean, they acknowledge it. It's not like it's controversial science that certain vaccines can't provide protection from asymptomatic spread, but it's not talked about and it's not talked about in the media. So I think for the general public, they will think that they are protecting other people by taking the COVID vaccine. And I don't think that there's gonna be a major effort to disabuse them of that notion. Wow, that's kind of depressing. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think just so quickly, if, if anyone's interested in this topic of, uh, there's a fascinating book written by Debbie Bookshin and uh, Jim Schumacher, who are both you know, celebrated journalists. Um, they looked into the rush uh, with the polio vaccine and all of the, the things that happened there, including, um, you know, our government giving 100 million children a vaccine they knew was contaminated with a cancer causing monkey virus and not recalling it and not telling the public because there was such a political need to rush it out. And I think that that is a great cautionary tale that we should all be reading right now to make sure we don't repeat history because we don't have to, we can be careful here. Yeah, excellent. Um, what is the title of the book? Um, it is called The Virus and the Vaccine. And then there's a colon and a lot of other <laughs> uh, sentences beyond it, but it's The Virus and the Vaccine. And it's by Debbie Bookchin and James Schumacher. Okay, so keep um, that. Kind of a rose out of a <laughs> I'll add that to the reading list. I've just recently got the Audible app. And so I've been listening to books as I drive and it's it's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, I would like to, we've got a few more minutes left and I would actually like to just segue a little bit into uh, electoral politics. Uh, we're really, yeah. wrapping, we're wrapping up a very different and a very controversial presidential election year. And, you know, over the past week, um, our show has actually hosted several candidates who were Asian American, who were running for office uh, for the first time in uh, various local levels couple state assembly um, candidates, including you, and then um, a city council member in Austin, Texas. And so anyway, I got very interested in their lives and their campaigns. And as I've been scouring the internet looking for local election results, I'm kind of sad to find that they all lost. Um, and you know, you also lost when you made your bid for office. And, you know, I understand that first time candidates have a really hard time, especially going up against incumbents. But I'm wondering, you know, what does it take to get more uh, progressive Asian Americans into elected office? Well, um, I wish I had the magic answer, <laughs> but um, I do, I did learn a lot uh, from my run and from losing and, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of politics is is um, is done in the years before you actually announce a run, which which I didn't know and hadn't been working on. But there's all kinds of I work with a lot of activists and I know a lot of people, but there are coalitions that have relationships with one another and power kind of levers of power um, that that even if you're not going to be part of that, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of an anti-establishment candidate. So to some extent, I'm never going to be embraced by those levers of power. But um, and also, you know, there are kind of racial elements to that 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 would make it harder. But um, there are things that I could have done to know about that and be ready to uh, hit the ground running uh, with coalitions that would be kind of organized enough to combat that. So I think um, that's a vague political <laughs> statement maybe, but I, I think that um, we just have to keep running and we have to keep connected, help other, I think a great thing to do is to help on other campaigns uh, to really get a sense for, you know, the community and the camp, 
you know, in the place that you're going to be running and who the different people are and build relationships. I think that's really important. Um, and also just, you know, helping one another to run. I think the more that we can sort of support one another uh, as as candidates of color and um, and progressive candidates uh, or whatever you um, want to call it. I don't love the word progressive, um, but I think the better chance we stand if we kind of stand with each other. Is there any kind of coalition um, of such candidates? Um, any kind of, I don't know, like effort to, um, you know, sort of, I, I think about F all these different groups that have organized to um, get females to run for office and usually white women. Um, but I wonder uh, for people of color, what um, if there is any kind of organized group, grassroots type organized group? Uh, <laughs> well, um, you know, that may exist in various places, but I think that substantially more efforts could be useful in that direction. I know that where I am <clears throat> in, in my region, we have efforts to um, train and run women candidates, but not to foster and support uh, candidates uh, of color. So I do think that that is a crucial next step here. Um, and maybe that already exists in many other places, but I think really setting up a dedicated coalition to support, draw out and foster uh, leadership among people of color in the community would be very well, um, a very good use of our resources. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see that happen. I um, Lots of things are going through my mind right now, and I should stick to the topics because um, we are running out of time. So we can't really talk about um, a winner of the presidential election because we don't have one yet. So I'm just kind of wondering if we could close with a little bit of imagination on your end. If we wake up um, to four more years of Trump next week, um, what do we face as a nation? And what do we face if we wake up to a Biden presidency? I think um, either way we wake up, we have substantial work to do to combat um, the deep divisions um, and distrust that have fomented. But there would be a big difference. I mean, in terms of the laws, to, to be honest, I'm not a, a huge I am a Democrat, but I'm not a huge Biden enthusiast. Um, I don't have tremendous faith that he will uh, he will support all the things that I care about. But I do think that the tone of the presidency makes a huge difference to uh, to many people's lives, especially people of color and uh, you know LGBTQ people and um, you know, so so many members of our society are vulnerable with the kind of hate, hatred, and and fomenting of hatred that that Trump presents. That regardless of what laws actually get changed or not, not having that tone uh, really uh, set for our entire nation is going to make a huge difference in our just physical safety. And yeah. Yeah. That's that's probably true. So let's well let's wait and see what we get, um, and yeah. keep and keep preparing to do a lot of hard work. So thank you everyone. We're um, out of time, and I just want to thank you for joining us this evening for our weekly Asian American Herald show. Once again, I'm Hamani Gupta Carlson, and my guest has been Ithaca-based civil rights attorney and activist Sajatha Gibson. The Asian American Herald is a Facebook-based news media outlet dedicated to discussing topics and building community among Asian Americans in the capital region of New York and beyond. So please continue to send us your story ideas and look for the recording of this show on our Facebook page. Thank you again and have a really good evening. Thank you, you too. It's such an honor to be on your show. It was a pleasure to talk to you. <laughs>
<laughs> you 